President. The Senator from Oklahoma. Madam President, one of the things about a, a debate like this is that uh, I, I have something that I always do, and that is I'll sit down and cross off things that I was going to say that somebody else has already said. Unfortunately, almost everything has been, has been said, but there are a few things that have not. Because I'd like to put this in more of a historic uh, perspective. I can remember back in 1968, 1968, I was elected to the Oklahoma State Senate. And at that time, we were all concerned about the deficit spending and the debt in this country. And I, I remember so well a kind old gentleman from Nebraska. Uh, he was the United States Senator Carl Curtis. Uh, Carl Curtis uh, contacted me because I was kind of a, an aggressive person at that time. And, uh, and he said, you know, I've got an idea. I've been up here trying to pass a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. This is Carl Curtis way back in 1968. And he said, I've been trying for years to do it. One of the primary objections that they have is they'd never get to have the majority, the three-fourths necessary to ratify the Constitution if we're successful in, uh, in passing this. So he said, this is my idea. Let's go ahead and get three-fourths of the states to pre-ratify a budget balancing amendment to the Constitution. And I thought that was an ingenious idea. And so uh, we, we did. And I passed a resolution in the Oklahoma State Senate, 1968, that uh, said that we were going to uh, pre-ratify it. And in fact, we actually got, we came within one state of having the three fourths necessary to do this. Not that that would have pre-ratified it, but it would have taken away the argument that Carl Curtis had uh, that they uh, objected to and that they would never be able to ratify this in the state. So anyway, I thought that was a great idea. We came close to doing it. And that was way back in 1968. And what was interesting, I do remember this very well. I was trying to impress upon the, uh, the American people how much that debt was. And at that time, the debt was $240 billion. And so I said, if you take dollar bills and stack them up, and, 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 and by the time you get to $240 billion, it's the height of the Empire State Building. And that was only $240 billion. Well, a lot of the groups and members who are opposed to passing the uh, balanced budget think that we don't need one. They actually believe that Congress and the President can balance the budget without any enforceable uh, accountability. Uh, but in 1986, when the amendment failed by one vote, and I remember that year so well because that was the year I was elected to the, the uh, House of Representatives here in Washington. Uh, the national debt at that time was $2.1 trillion. But by 1997, when the Senate considered the amendment again, the debt had risen to over $5 trillion, and it got up to about uh, $10 trillion when this president took office, and, uh, and that's, that's where this all starts. Well, what has happened since President Obama has been in office is something that's totally unprecedented in the history of this country. It's gone up in just the years that he's been there, 42%. So here I was concerned back in 1968 with, with uh, $240 billion, and now the increase in just this short period of time uh, increases our debt from 10 to $15 trillion. Now, I, I, I think everyone knows that the need for, to reduce spending is, is evident. We don't have to do anything more than to look across the Atlantic. I think my friend from Wyoming covered that pretty well. But when you stop and think about what has happened over in Europe, about these countries over there, it's not just Greece and Italy, other countries too, they could not they, they resist the insatiable appetite to spend money def in a deficit that they didn't have. And, and that's exactly what has happened, is happening in this country. We're right behind, I agree with my friend from Wyoming, we're right behind uh, Europe in this case. I remember, and I think probably everyone in this chamber remembers back during your, your elementary years, reading about the history of this country, a guy named Alexis de, Alexis de Tocqueville came to the United States. He came here, oddly enough, to study our penal system. This is back in the founding, the founding years of this country. And when he got here, he was so impressed with the wealth of this nation that he stayed and he wrote a book. And in this book, he talked about how one plot of land was given to each person who came over and they were able to keep the, the benefits of that which they, of their hard labor. And the prosperity was just indescribable at that time. But he observed, he said, and this is in the last paragraph of the de Tocqueville uh, book, he said, and this is a quote, he wants the people of this country find they can vote themselves money out of the public trust, the system will fail. 
Well, that's where we are. And that's why I say this isn't just an ordinary time. This isn't 1968 or 1986, 1997, where we've tried this before. This is to the point where we're going to realize the accuracy of de Tocqueville's prediction. Because right now, as we well know, it's been uh, publicized recently, 47% of the people are not paying federal taxes, not paying income taxes. That means that's dangerously close to that 50% that he was talking about several hundred years ago. So this year, uh, Washington's been patting itself on the back with the, the Budget Control Act that we passed in August, which cut spending by $900 billion over the next 10 years. We're slowly starting to chip away at appropriation bills. But the, these have not been as advertised. They've not come close to solving the problem. This is demonstrated by the fact that next year's deficit is still expected to be right around a, a trillion dollars. Now, this is kind of interesting because I look sometimes, I know this is kind of offensive to some of the people participating in this, this great committee that we had that was charged with the responsibility of finding a trillion dollars over 10 years. And when I, I talked to the a very large chamber group in Oklahoma on Monday morning, we had uh, over 500 people there. And I said, you know, can you really understand what is, what is happening here in terms of, of the request that has been made of coming up with a trillion dollars over 10 years? Here we have a president, and let's keep in mind, as this senator from Wyoming said, the president submits a budget. It's not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not the House, not the Senate. It's the president. And he submitted his budget. He's now submitted three budgets. In his three budgets, he's had deficits each year of almost one and a half trillion dollars. Mr. Uh, Madam President, I remember in 1997 going down to the floor. At that time, uh, Bill Clinton was president of the United States, and that was the first one and a half trillion dollar budget to run the country. Now, that was at one and a half trillion dollars to run the entire country of the United States of America. And yet, the, this president has come up with one and a half trillion dollars in deficit over and above the revenues that we had each year for three years. Now, if you have the requirement of coming up with $1 trillion over 10 years, and yet this president has increased the deficit by almost $5 trillion in the short period of time, probably will be $6 trillion by the time the last budget is realized, then how in the world are you ever going to dig out of this thing? Well, the answer is you can't. It's, uh, it's, uh, I went further when I was talking to the people in, in Oklahoma on Monday, and I said the requirement for the first year is $44 billion. Well, if you take $44 billion as a requirement to cut spending in the first of 10 years, and yet that same 10 year, that same one year, the president has had an increase of one and a half trillion dollars in his budget just for one year. Obviously, that's not much of a requirement, and that's not going to do it. And to me, that demonstrates what we, what we don't, are not able to do without having a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. The... Amendment that we have makes it difficult to raise taxes. It also uh, requires that the president and Congress pass a balanced budget each year. And that does something else that's very significant. The amendment would also limit the amount of spending allowed to 18% of GDP, which is the historic level that we've, uh, uh, of revenue uh, the federal government has collected since World War II. So it, it covers these things. People who uh, complain about it saying, well, we don't know. There could be times of crises. There could be times of war. This has it built in. If we're in a declared war, you don't have to follow the guidelines of the budget balancing amendment. In fact, you could, have, you could actually violate it because that's in times of war. We understand that. If it's not a declared war, you could do it with a supermajority. So this has those built-in safeguards to take care of contingencies that we can't determine what they are right now, such as war, such as a crisis that we have. Now, some of those people, not too many people will come to the floor and say this, but in their own minds, they still believe this idea that more government spending can actually make the economy grow. And I don't know how, how they can still believe that after what they call the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act it was $825 billion. That was supposed to, Madam President, remember, that was supposed to be a stimulus package that's supposed to stimulate the economy. And yet only 3% of that actually went to things that were specifically would stimulate the economy, such as roads, bridges, and things that we're supposed to do. It was all financed with extra government debt and with projects like Solyndra, which has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently, and, and other projects. It was more social engineering. We all know that. 
And so we know that you can't increase spending to pull us out of the situation that we are in. They also said that that would cause the unemployment rate to get down below, well below uh, uh, 8%. Of course, we know now that it didn't do that. And so none of the predictions actually came to uh, be realized. The economy is still very weak, despite the fact that the president was able to secure nearly a trillion in stimulus spending. It didn't help this time. It's not going to help again. It's never helped in the past. Now, to enforce the amendment, the courts would be prevented from mandating tax hikes. Further, it, uh, to raise the debt limit, uh, a three-fifth majority of both chambers, both, not just one, would be required. And so it does take care of all these contingencies that I think uh, would be necessary and the answer of the complaints that people have who say that they don't want to have, it be dangerous to have a balanced budget amendment. I, I know it works. The funny thing about it, when they say it won't work, look at the laboratories we have for the, for the federal government. My state of Oklahoma, balanced budget amendment, it has all these things built into it. Uh, in fact, it's not as generous as the ones that we are uh, advocating. But nonetheless, I remember my years in the state legislature. We get up toward the end of the year and they'd say, well, wait a minute, we can't do that because we can't go into a deficit. You know, if the states can't do it, it we could pass the same thing. So I would merely say that try to put it in the historic perspective. If you do that, then you'll see why it's a sense of urgency that 47% of the people are on the receiving end of government and would turn around and, and uh, get to that point where de Tocqueville said we cannot go be uh, beyond. Remember in 1968, the Carl Curtis thing, that was a $240 billion deficit. 1986, $2.1 trillion. Then 1990, it was up to $10 trillion. But it took all that time to get up to $10 trillion, and that has almost doubled with this one administration with this president. So we're not, this isn't business as usual. This isn't like the balanced budget uh, amendments have been in the past. They are structured very much the same way, but the sense of crisis is here. I've got 20 kids and grandkids, and what we do here isn't going to affect me personally, but it's going to affect the future generations. This is our opportunity to really do something meaningful. And I urge the support of SJ Res 10, a strong balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. And I'll yield the floor. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cockeye. 